Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Elevate and Accelerate. I'm your host, Zach Viscomi, and I am excited to be kicking off this podcast finally. So what's this all about? Well, I wanted to start this podcast because I really enjoy working with small to medium business owners and entrepreneurs and really helping them to achieve higher levels of success. Um, I did this as a business agent for a celebrity branding agency, and now again, uh, as the president and COO of the same company. And so I really just feel like there's a lot of people out there who don't have the resources or the support that they might be looking for, um, especially small to medium businesses. And so I thought that this podcast would be a resource to those people um, sharing ideas of what other entrepreneurs are doing, uh, things that I've learned after working with hundreds of clients in many different industries all over the world. And so I felt like what a what's a better way than, um, than a podcast to at least help share this information. So hopefully, uh, you find it valuable and, uh, and without further ado, let's jump into today's topic. So today, what I really wanted to focus on is, uh, the foundation of what branding even is and why it matters to the small and medium business owner. Uh, there's a lot of definitions about that. There's a lot of, uh, different connotations that branding has. Um, but I'll start at least by telling you that it is probably the most important thing about your business um, besides, you know, the products themselves and, and otherwise. But, um, but what you'll see here, I think, is, um, is the key to helping you achieve that next level of success. And I'll tell you why. But what I feel like I've witnessed um, and, and I think is, is pretty true, uh, Michael Gerber talks about this in his book, The E-Myth, but um, it's this idea that when entrepreneurs set out, um, he said that they a lot of times were uh, are technicians. They're people who are really good at doing a certain task and uh, get tired of working under somebody else. And so they make the decision to go do it on their own, but they're not quite an entrepreneur. Uh, they're more of, like I said, a technician, but Really what I found is that um, most people that I work with and, and really what they want at the core of it is that they find either a problem that they have a unique skill set to fix or they see a, a gap in, um, in services or they see an opportunity to uh, make somebody's life easier. Uh, whether they've had to go through the same experience themselves um, and now they want to make it easier for other people or, uh, you know, it's just something that maybe they saw um, in their day to day life and uh, felt like they could provide a solution that that worked um, that would make an impact in the world. And so for most entrepreneurs and really what we're seeing is that it starts with this passion. They're passionate about something. Um, and then whether they're working at a nine to five or, um, you know, sort of in uh, some sort of other grind, um, they realize that this passion that they have is really their purpose. And so they set out, they start a business, they, um, you know, they hit the ground running, they're, they're doing all the things uh, that they can uh, to get this business off the ground and in front of more people. And what ends up happening most of the time um, is, and I think 50% of the time is the stats right now, uh, that these businesses will fail within the first year uh, of getting into business. So, uh, I mean, that's a staggering number. Um, you know, there's people starting businesses all the time. Uh, and the fact that half of them aren't even going to make it out of the first year is pretty surprising. Um, and then that number goes up when you hit the five-year mark. Um, so it, it's over half uh, don't even make it to five years and, and then beyond. So, um, you know, the question is, is, well, what ends up happening? Why, why for those that make it past one year, they don't make it past five? Um, and the reality is, is that that passion, which became their purpose in the start of the business at some point probably hits a plateau. Um, they just can't seem to grow anymore. Uh, they realize really that in order for them to be able to grow, uh, it requires more of them. They're trading their time for work. Um, excuse me, they're, they're trading their time for, for money again, which uh, for a lot of people is a big reason why they wanted to get out of the nine to five in the first place. But the reality is, is that when, uh, when these individuals go out to start their businesses, what they're not thinking of is HR. They're not thinking of accounting and keeping the books. They're not thinking about the operations and the fulfillment and everything else that goes into running a business. They're just thinking about the product itself. And so they know how to do the product very, very well. 
uh, especially in the professional services industries, right? And, and those are a lot of the clients that I've worked with, whether it's lawyers or financial advisors or real estate agents or coaches or therapists or whatever it might be. Um, these are the providers of the product more often than not, dentists, chiropractors, right? And so if they are not working, uh, then there's no product to sell and, and obviously clients are getting mad or you're not having any clients at all. And so, um, and so this, this entrepreneur essentially is bound to the business. They've, they've basically created themselves a job and not only a job that they were quite possibly doing before, but now they created a bunch of other jobs that they have to do as well. And, and I imagine that by, by year five, it's just complete burnout. Um, and really even more so is that, uh, as you'll see in a little bit here is, is, um, you can't just maintain a business, uh, maintaining the status quo is a recipe for disaster. And, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. And so, you know, what, what, what is a, an entrepreneur to do? How do you break through that five-year wall? How do you take it to the next level, uh, and, and reach more clients and reach more prospects and attract your ideal clients, right? Because I bet a lot of this too, especially early on is you're taking out, you're taking on any client. And at some point you want to be able to, to filter through and really only work with your ideal client. So how do you do that? Um, and today we're going to talk about that a little bit further next week. We'll get into it a little bit deeper, but, uh, for today, what are some options that would free up the time of the entrepreneur to allow them, uh, to do more of what they do best and to, and to grow their revenue? Well, um, hiring a team. Right. That's that's probably one of the, the easiest and most difficult things. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things you can outsource. There's virtual assistants out there. Um, there are uh, uh, bookkeepers that do like fractional bookkeeping. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that you can do without having to hire a W2 employee uh, to to help free up some of the things that you're doing. So think about the things that you really don't like doing the most. Um, usually the things that you put off until you really can't put it off anymore and see if there's a solution out there for you, um, to, to hire somebody either fractionally or hire another agency or hire somebody who can handle some of those things so that you can focus on it, uh, you know, doing what you do best. The other thing, um, the other alternative here is, is really just maintaining, um, you know, if you can't hire a team, you're not making enough money or you don't have the time to, to train somebody, or you have high turnover, because a lot of times what entrepreneurs do is they hire somebody and then they're like, oh good, I can just pass this off, right? And so it's, um, it's delegation by abdication. abdication. Um, we're, uh, we're a part of an, uh, an operating system called EOS. It's the Entrepreneur's Operating System at Celebrity Branding Agency, which is a phenomenal, phenomenal way to run a business. So um, if you're interested, definitely check that out. But uh, we've been running that for, for some time now. And one of the big things is, um, is really looking at how can you delegate what you have to offer? Um, how can you delegate the things off of your plate that frees up your time and allows you to uh, to really be able to do the and focus on what your, as Dan Sullivan calls your unique ability, right? So, um, and so it, it's, it's a delegation, um, but rather than by abdication, it's by, um, by training, right? So you, you sit with that person and you train them, uh, to be able to perform the duties well. And as long as they have the, the abilities and the capacity and, and the bandwidth to be able to do it, um, then you can pass it off to them and it's a process, but then at that point you can let it go because if you just pass it off, a lot of times, many of you, I'm sure would find that now you're stuck in this position where, um, you know, you, you don't really know what's going on in your business. Um, you're, you're getting emails that this person isn't reaching out or this isn't the same quality as it was before, or, you know, they're doing things differently now. And so you go to check it out and it's, you know, the person that you hired is doing their best because you're super busy doing other things. And so now they're running their business as they see fit, not running it as the way you see fit, uh, which is obviously detrimental to the company uh, that you built for a specific reason to provide a specific service in a specific way, right? Um, the other alternative here is, is this um, idea that, okay, well, um, I'm having a difficult time growing. I've sort of hit my stride. I can't take on any more clients. 
um, you know, I've sort of reached my max time wise. So my best opportunity here is to just maintain, maintain the status quo. As long as I keep making this income, um, you know, we can, we can live off of this. It's fine. And I can do this, you know, well into my sixties if I need to, whatever it is. Right. And so that's, it's immediately this idea of let's just maintain. And as soon as you get out of the growth mindset, whatever that growth looks like, whether it's hiring somebody new or, um, or charging more for your services or offering a, a different set of services, whatever it is, uh, as soon as you stop focusing on innovation and growth is the time that your business starts to die. Uh, it's more than likely a, a death by a thousand cuts than it is like, you know, you got your head chopped off. But the reality is, uh, is that maintaining is is same thing as it applies to people, right? Maintaining a business is the same thing as maintaining the status quo in your life. Uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. If you're not if you're not pushing to the next level, uh, then you're falling backwards. Um, there really is no middle ground of of maintaining something. I've got a great example of that my stepdad uh, started with his dad a classified ad newspaper back in the eighties. You know, people would call in, they'd put their ads in there, whether that was for, you know, selling something they had in their house, or if it was a local company who wanted to take out a color, uh, full page, half page, you know, quarter page, whatever it was, right, with different prices, et cetera. Basically a, a Facebook marketplace and Craigslist on paper. Uh, we would distribute that paper for free, and then people could, you know, find out what's in the area. Uh, the paper did really well. Uh, it was pretty successful uh, in the immediate area and surrounding towns and a few cities and different things. And so uh, it was a great business and it ran well for for a long time. Uh, Enter in Craigslist and, and now uh, that type of stuff was more accessible and um, our clients didn't have to pay for it with Craigslist, but they did have to pay for it with us. Um, it took some time before a lot of people felt safe doing it that route. Um, you know, the paper didn't see a huge decrease in support. Um, however, the page count, which was a great way to determine the health of the company, um, you know, especially in the busy months, started to, to decline. Uh, usually the peak was around 62 or 64 pages, which then became 58 pages, which then was 50. And then, you know, it would dip into the 40s and then back up to the 50s. And there was just this time where it was like, you know, if, if we're just trying to maintain the status quo, um, there wasn't a lot of pressure or urgency put on understanding the need for digitizing the product. Um, there was some thought about it. It was put online, but it was nothing more than an online brochure. Um, but fundamentally everything was exactly the same. You couldn't even purchase anything um, online, you just had to call in. And so there was a lot of different things. Um, but fast forward to, you know, the pandemic in 2020 and the uncertainty of everything then. Uh, and, and the paper was already on a steady decline and probably maintaining, you know, half of what it used to be. But still, you know, the idea was, well, even, even this, I can live off of this. It's fine. You know, we'll make do, we'll get by the business will always be here. And then it got to the point where it just wasn't sustainable anymore. Now, what I didn't tell you is that throughout the years, uh, my stepdad got several, uh, seven figure offers for the business. Um, but he wasn't interested in selling at that time and rightfully so, or at one point wanted to negotiate more. Um, but either way, the, the opportunities came and went. Uh, and when the time came for him to want to sell the business, no one was interested because at that point, um, you know, Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, everything is, is where everybody's going. And, you know, while there's some loyal customers and local businesses that, uh, were continually keeping it afloat, it just wasn't practical and not worth anybody else's time. So I think it ended up going to a family member who was trying to take it online and, I have no idea where it is right now, but I tell you that story for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, kind of proof in the pudding that maintaining the status quo isn't really the best way to go. Uh, but two, that it's not only not the best way to go, it's probably the most detrimental way to go for an entrepreneur because uh, it's it's a surefire way to to lose your business over time. Now that took him maybe 10 years um, but still just the same. Um, and so I want to at least help you avoid, uh, something like that. And so 
okay, well, what's the other opportunity here? Since, since we've established the fact that most entrepreneurs, especially in the professional services industry, are trading their time for money. And so if they want to make more money, they need to, uh, they need to work more. Um, well, they can't really work more, so they need to hire people to do the work that they can't do or don't want to do so they can focus on the work that brings in the revenue. Um, and so we're just we're, we're stuck on this hamster wheel of trying to figure out how to get more money without working more. Um, and, and so the next logical conclusion is, is like, well, I need to raise my prices, but most people don't feel good about raising their prices. A lot of times they're waffling back and forth, um, because they, they feel awkward putting a value on their service, especially if they're not changing their services at all. They're just raising the prices. Um, you know, they, uh, we see it happen all the time, especially now, um, you know, with the current state of the economy, right? It's, it's inflation is skyrocketing, prices are astronomical, supply chains are, are disrupted. And so we're, we're feeling the repercussions of that. And many industries are having to raise their prices because the prices are getting raised on them and so on and so forth. But yet um, many of the clients and people that I work with are still hesitant to raise their prices, right? Because um, they're good people. Uh, really, at the end of the day, I think good people have this conundrum of wanting to raise their prices because not so much that maybe they devalue themselves, although I do think that's a part of it, but I think it's because they really are passionate about helping people and they know that the minute that they raise their prices, that they're going to price out somebody and that doesn't feel good. Um, and so then they try to, you know, come up with sliding scales, especially if they're therapists or different price points, which gets it confusing. And then, and then it communicates, um, you know, the value that you're actually placing on this. And so if you're placing a hundred dollar value on a product, um, and then you're willing to slide that scale down to 75, well, then everybody else is going to believe that the value for that is really $75. Um, you're just marking it up like everybody does. And so how do you, how do you balance this price and value um, relationship? And uh, one of the things um, my chief marketing officer told me, um, Guy Colangelo, um, was, was really interesting that stuck with me. And Dan Kennedy, I think, was the one who, who had said this before. But uh, essentially, it's, it's at the intersection of price and value is the experience. Um, and so if we kind of circle back now to branding, um, and I'll answer a lot of these questions through the importance of a brand here, um, branding is an experience. It's, the, it's a repetitive experience over and over again. You can think of some of the biggest companies in the world, right? Uh, let's talk about McDonald's, for instance. Um, whether or not <laughs> you agree with their food or what they're doing, we can all agree that McDonald's has a system um, that is duplicated over and over and over again in every store around the world. People walk in there and they know what to expect. They know the time behind it. They know they know um, what the the buns are going to look like, where the pickles are placed. They're going to know uh, the size of the patties. Um, you know the the cook on the on the fries. I mean everything is down to a science. Um, and and so it's that experience that is the brand of McDonald's. Uh, same thing's true for, uh, let's say like the Four Seasons hotels and resorts around the world, right? When you go there, you expect a specific type of treatment. I was there for the first time um, not that long ago. And I went in there with this thought of, okay, what about this hotel is like every other hotel? And what about this hotel is different that allows them to command such a higher price than most other hotels. And so, um, and so I, I, I went into it with that mindset and I'll tell you, if you, if there was no interaction with the people, with the employees, with, um, you know, some of the things there, it, it would the experience essentially, if the experience itself wasn't there, it would be no different than really any other hotel. The facilities weren't that great, um, you know, like astronomically so. Um, it wasn't like, you know, the food was 100 times better or anything like that. I mean, it was all really good. Um, but in and of themselves, none of those things uh, would command, you know, a price that's double than some of the places in the area, right? Um, but 
There was the little things. It was the experience from the minute that you walked in the door, from the greetings that the staff gave you, from uh, them offering you a glass of wine or champagne as you check in to, um, you know, giving detailed instructions to where the elevator is and where your room is to, um, you know, uh, coming in, um, we were at an event. So I came back in that evening just to get changed for the, the evening event. Um, and they had set my room for the evening. They had a, a bottle of water next to my table, which obviously I had to pay for, but they put it right there. Um, you know, they had uh, a notepad there. They had, um, you know, they, they organized my stuff um, that was on the floor. You know, there was, there was just little things that they did. And it was obvious that they just kind of popped in and popped out um, to kind of set the room for the night. But it was, it was those little things that provided a whole experience. And that is the brand. So every time that you go to a Four Seasons, you, you start to expect that type of experience. So that is the brand, right? Well, what about for you? What's a personal brand then? Um, and a personal brand is how someone experiences or perceives you. Um, and that's what starts to get, get weird for people because, you know, if you think about, um, if you think about the branding budget for McDonald's or Apple or, you know, Coca-Cola or some of these large organizations, I mean, they spend millions and millions of dollars on commercials that talk about nothing. <laughs> like you might see a, a Coca-Cola can, right? But it's, it's a, all about the experience. They're showing you the experience that you're going to have um, as a Coca-Cola drinker. Um, and, and that's the idea. And so they're communicating the experience. Well, how do you do the same thing? How do you duplicate that? Especially when you don't have a million dollar budget, how do you communicate that to somebody? And so, um, we were talking about raising prices and being able to raise the value. And so, um, if at the intersection of price and value is the experience, then if you can increase, um, the, the experience that they are having and the value of the experience that you're having with this, which is essentially you and your, your company, um, then it commands, then you're able to command a higher price for it. Um, you know, I've, I, uh, I drive a Volkswagen. I love the car. I've always wanted, um, I've always wanted it. It's a 2011 GTI that I've done some work on. Um, but if you look at, uh, the next level up, which is Audi, um, they're owned by the same people. But when you go, when you walk into a Volkswagen dealership versus when you walk into an Audi dealership, you get a completely different experience. But a lot of the parts are the same. I mean, the product itself has some nuances and some differences. And, and obviously, it's more of a luxury line and, and performance line. But uh, there's, there's a lot of overlap between the two. And so the main difference is the experience that the person has, whether that's in the sales process or it's in the car, but the cost of those cars is astronomically different than the cost of a Volkswagen, right? Uh, in, in many instances anyway. So, uh, so this is what I'm trying to teach and what I love teaching, uh, entrepreneurs and business professionals is that your personal brand is the gateway for you being able to, uh, legitimize the raising of your prices and ultimately to attract your ideal client. And so what is branding? Um, we've talked about branding now a couple of times we have, you know, we talked about experience. We talked about you being a brand. Um, but what is it? Uh, most of the time when you ask somebody, they'll say, well, it's your colors, um, it's your logo, it's, um, you know, it's all those things. And, and that's true. Uh, those are your brand because that's how someone visually experiences your company. Um, but it's more than that, right? It's uh, a brand is a story. So those colors tell a story of who you are. There's a reason why McDonald's chose uh, red and yellow and why all fast food companies have red and yellow because they want to get people in and out quickly. Um, but then there's, uh, you know, there's other places when you go to a spa or wherever, where they have more neutral colors or more cooling and soft colors, because, uh, it's a spot of relaxation. So colors say a lot about the experience that you're going to have. Right. And so that's part of the story, but, um, but really a brand is nothing more than a story. And so personal branding is really your story, um, which makes branding storytelling. And so a great brand is a story that others tell for you. Now, uh, our CEO and founder of Celebrity Branding Agency, Nick Nanton, is, um, is the one who's been saying that for decades. 
Um, and, and I took it because there's no better way to say it. Um, and I, and I think it's amazing, but the reality is, is that you and your story is the brand. And we're going to dig into a little bit deeper next week to really talk about that. But, um, many of you are aware of the, uh, supply and demand curve, right? And so how does the supply and demand curve work with this price and value, you know, um, uh, graph and everything else. And, and what I've realized is, is that if you can increase your value by positioning yourself as the go-to expert and authority in your field, which we talk about um, as the business trifecta is media, marketing, and PR. If you can use mass media credentials in, in your marketing um, and third-party validation to back it all up, you have, you have the three legs to the stool that not only supports your business, but also gives you what you need to propel into the next level. So as we talked about earlier, your passion then transitions into a purpose. You start this business, you start hitting the ground running, which quickly plateaus because you're trading time for money. Um, and then you find yourself sort of standing on this precipice of, well, I'm, I'm hustling. I'm working more hours than I ever thought I had to. I'm, I'm bound by my business. I can't take vacations. Um, you know, if I get away, I'm wondering, I'm always wondering when, what I'm coming back to, right? You're like, you're, you're chained to your company. And so you're standing at this precipice of, well, what do I do? Like, I don't really want to maintain this, but I also don't want to jump over the edge and just close it down either. So, so what's my alternative? Um, and so if you, what I'm presenting as a, a viable solution that we've proven with our clients and, um, you know, with Nick and myself and moving forward, uh, with other people as well, is that if you can increase the perceived value of your brand, it gives you the platform to be able to increase your price. But increasing your value also increases that demand. And, um, and so if you have an increase of demand at a higher price point, but you then you automatically, because we're talking about time for money, you have the trade-off of being able to decrease the supply, which is your amount of time. And so now we're looking at um, the intersection of price and value moving higher up the list. Um, so you're, as your price, as your value goes up, your price goes up. And then we know that as, as demand goes up and supplies goes down, you also get to raise your prices. And so you have these two things that are working in conjunction with each other that, that validate you being able to raise your prices. Uh, I want to give you an example. I work with this energy healer. Her name is Wendy. Um, I know that's super woo woo and, and whatever. Um, she gets results and, uh, has done a phenomenal job in helping me. Um, and actually she's gotten into, um, working with a lot of large corporations, uh, with their employees and their executive staff. Um, and so much so, I mean, she's been in so much demand, um, that the supply of her time was becoming more and more limited. And so she was in, uh, she's in private practice. She hired other people who could do what she do. She trained them, um, to be able to do it, but obviously everyone wanted her again, uh, you know, put yourself in her shoes. This is a, an example and a case study of, of how you could do this as well. So what she did was, is her one-on-one -on -one time, she raised her prices and she went from charging, I don't remember what it was. Let's say it was $150 an hour. Um, what I do remember is that she doubled it and then it was up by 150%. So she ended up charging uh, close to $400 for an hour or an hour and a half of her time. Um, because she was in so much demand at these corporations where she was already charging more money. And so if she was going to take time out of over here, um, she had to make it worth her while. Um, and so obviously that priced out a ton of people, myself included. Now she still makes herself available in some other things too. So that's not saying anything bad about her, but she's been able to offer, um, you know, a whole lot more to, uh, to the community because she's freed up her time to focus on, on other things. Um, and so, you know, I, I say that as an encouragement that, you know, whatever your level of success is, right. Because we all define that differently. I don't think, um, most people that we're working with are trying to be the next, you know, Tony Robbins or Grant Cardone or something like that. Would it be great? Sure. Um, you know, that type of money would be awesome. But at the end of the day, I think most people have some sort of 
goal in their minds, whether that's, um, you know, making multiple six figures or, um, you know, just not having to worry about uh, bills or, or doing what they want. They can just pick up and go on a vacation for a month or whatever it is. It's freedom. Um, really what I think at the core of all of this is entrepreneurs are looking for an opportunity to create freedom and choice for themselves and their family. Um, and really even their clients too, I'm sure in many ways. Um, and it's, it's that, that search for freedom. It's that, um, it's that search for having the ability to choose, uh, even to be able to choose which clients you work with. Um, that is kind of the holy grail of being an entrepreneur, right? And, and why is raising your prices so important? Well, um, think about it this way. Let's say that you're, um, for the sake of conversation, your goal of success is to make 200 grand a year uh, in income, yeah, personal income. And so um, you reach, um, you've reached 200 grand, but you're working 80 hours a week. And you're also doing admin, you're doing all these other things, you're, you're at your max, you really can't take on more. Um, or let's say that you're, um, let's rewind that a little bit. And let's say you're, you're at 150 grand, right? And you really want to get to 200. That's a benchmark for you. That feels like, okay, like this business is what I set out to make it right. But but you're stuck at 150, because you can't take on any more clients. So by raising your price, it allows you to work with less clients, but make the same amount of money, or it helps you to be able to bring on the same, um, it helps you bring on less clients making the same amount of money or bring on more clients if that's what you want to do by hiring a team. And by charging more for your services, you also make more money. So I know I said earlier that maintaining is, is, a, is a bad place to be, right? And so uh, we don't want to look at this as, okay, well, I want to scale back I'm going to raise my prices, scale back um, so that I can just focus on time with my family. Um, that's not just maintaining, right? There's still some growth. I can hire somebody. I can train somebody else. How can I free up more of my time? How can I, how can I do things more efficiently? How can I cut expenses? You know, there's, there's so many different ways in which you can grow without actually taking on more clients, for instance, um, or, or continually, you know, you just have to be um, outpacing your attrition rate. Right. Um, so anyway, at the end of the day, um, what I, what I hope that this has been, um, communicating to you is that your ability to achieve the life of success that you always wanted, um, within your control and honestly within your budget more than likely is all, is all income is, um, and work within your budget is is really built on your brand and the value that others see in your brand. So to give you some examples before we wrap here, um, I want you to think about it this way. Take, take whatever it is that you're doing for marketing right now. However you get prospects to raise their hand, say that they're interested, and then either schedule an appointment with you or whatever it is. So let's say um, just for the sake of conversation that you send out a mailer. Let's say it's a postcard, right? Those things, um, you know, people are on on both sides of the camp of how effective they are. Um, I think that they're great. I think they're a great tool. I don't think that they're the only tool, but, um, but let's talk about a direct mailer. So you send something in the mail and let's say you are a, a financial advisor and you're saying, um, you know, hey, are you nearing retirement and don't know what you're going to do? Um, are you, do you look at your portfolio and think there's no way I'm going to be able to retire or do you not even have a portfolio? I am holding a, an exclusive webinar for 25 people, um, or an exclusive seminar, uh, for 25 people in the area. Uh, if that sound, if this, if any of this sounds like you, you know, call this number and, and sign up whatever, go to this website and register, whatever it is, right? Now, someone's going to see that. And unless they were like, man, I really need somebody right now, it's going to go on a pile of, oh, I'll look at that later. Or, oh, this is just trash. I'm not interested. Um, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Oh, my friend has somebody who they're using. I still have to talk to them. You know, it's a reminder for, for somebody else, not you. 
Um, now imagine, imagine that same mailer went out. Um, it's got your picture on it. And next to it, it says, as seen on ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox, um, or, you know, it's got those logos there, um, or it's got, you know, best-selling author of X, Y, and Z book, or, you know, some of these um, mass media credentials that people automatically attribute um, another level of trust to. And so now they're a little more interested in what you have to say right? Because they see you as somebody that they should pay attention to because of that credibility. So now that person who um, otherwise was kind of eh, is, is a step further in the process, right? So let's say that same person who got the first postcard gives you a call. They're going to be skeptical, right? They're going to be, they're going to be having a conversation with you. That's all about building trust, not finding out about your product, although that it might be disguised as that, right? And you know, um, if you go straight into the services that you provide without getting to know them, without talking to them about what their needs are, that you're probably going to lose that sale, right? Because we don't sell products, you know, we sell the, we sell the result that the product gives, okay? So the same thing's true in this situation, but now you're, you're having to spend your first conversation with them or the better part of that conversation, convincing them that you're somebody they can trust and that they should work with. And they're really skeptical because they get this stuff all the time, right? So now the second flyer that shows up with all that credibility already built into it, they have a different perspective of who you are as the expert providing these services. Now, obviously you still have to show up and you still have to deliver, um, but the conversation starts out a little bit different. They might still be hesitant, but they're not skeptical, right? And so the more that you show up in front of them with videos, with, the, with your website, with credibility, with testimonials, with you know, your story of who you are and why you do what you do, um, which is probably one of the most key elements to any business, um, especially, especially your business, which uh, I will talk about more next week and the art of telling your story. So, um, but it's, it's those little things that increase the perceived value of what you are able to provide. And then when you deliver on that as the expert, as somebody who knows what they're doing, especially to your ideal client, um, then it, it warrants that raising of prices. Now you get to start um, choosing who you want to work with. Um, you have the opportunity to choose the type of life that you want to live, whether that's you want to take on more clients or you want to pull back a little bit and, and go take a, a month long vacation with your family, um, or on your own, right? For those of you who don't have a family or maybe on your own when you do have a family, I don't know, but, um, but either way, like, uh, my goal, my, my passion, uh, my ambition behind all of this and why I called this show Elevate and Accelerate is because as you can elevate your brand, you get to accelerate the journey to living that life of success that you always wanted, of making a greater impact in the lives of the people around you. And that's what this is all about. Um, we talk about it all the time that we love working with people who are mission-driven celebrity experts. Um, people who are on a mission aren't going to get stopped by the first obstacle that comes in their way or the second or the third. They are on a mission to make a difference in the lives of other people. They're, they're, um, they're on a mission, maybe even to just make more money. You know, a lot of times that feels like such a taboo thing to say, but, um, but the reality is, is we all want to on some level make more money because it provides us with choices. And those choices then, and what we do with those choices is ultimately what defines who we are as people. And so if you can make more money in your business, which then allows you to use that money to make a greater impact in your community, in the lives of your family, of your children, of your friends, whatever, then, then why not? It's almost as if um, that's what we're supposed to do uh, as entrepreneurs. We've been given this gift. Um, and if, you know, uh, not to get in a conversation about economics, but um, but capitalism was really built on the foundation of the benevolent business owner, somebody who's going to take those profits and rather than keeping them all for themselves, gives to the community and helps support it in other ways, right? And so, um, and so that's what this is all about. How can we help you make an impact in more lives? And how do we position you in a way to have greater influence in those lives? And if I do my job well, 
which I know you will do your job well, then by extension, we, uh, myself as a person, and we as a company at Celebrity Branding Agency have now impacted more lives than we could just on our own. And then when you do that, and then the next person does that, it's, it's exponential, the impact that we can have. And that's what this is all about. Our mission at Celebrity Branding Agency is to empower people to live lives of joyful impact and significance. And, uh, and further episodes will explain more of what that is, but I hope you got some value today. I hope you got some value in understanding that a brand is a story uh, and really your brand is your story. And the way that you share that story and the way that you articulate your brand directly affects the type of clients that you attract, your ability to, um, to raise your prices, telling your story on mass media, using those credentials in your marketing, et cetera. So um, future episodes, we will talk about leverage. We'll talk about you know, uh, celebrity branding. Why celebrity? Why we even talk about that? Um, but next week specifically, we're going to dive into your core story. Um, what is a story? What makes up a good story? And how do we how do we use that as business owners uh, to make um, a greater difference um, and attract our ideal clients? So thank you for your time, and I look forward to hearing from you and talking with you next week. Cheers. <music>